Welcome back to part two of our double episode on the class struggle in Mandate Rule Palestine. If you haven't listened to part one yet, then I recommend you go back and listen to that first. A la mattina, appena alzata, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 a la mattina. Before we get started, just a reminder that our podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Our supporters fund our work and in return get exclusive early access to podcast episodes without ads, bonus episodes, free and discounted merch and other content. For example, our Patreon supporters can listen to an exclusive bonus episode now in which we discuss the curious relationship of British authorities to the Palestinian workers' movement as well as the labour movement in Nazareth before, during and immediately after the Nakba, and Zionist dishonesty in relation to the slogans of the pro-Palestine movement. Join us or find out more at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, link in the show notes. These episodes form part of the Palestine Digital Exhibition with Collectors as part of Chapter 2, a collaboration with over 300 volunteers in Palestine and around the world. You can check out the exhibition on the link in the show notes. As a content note for our listeners, this episode contains some descriptions of war crimes. At the end of part one, we finished with Palestinian scholar Lina Delache's discussion of the crushing defeat of the Great Revolt in 1939, which devastated Palestinian civil society, killing, wounding, imprisoning or exiling about 10% of the adult male population. The Palestinian labour movement was also affected, essentially contracting back to its original base in Haifa, where, even there, it remained largely dormant. However, with the outbreak of World War II, things changed drastically. So the 1940s, there was a massive proletarization in Palestine that is tied to British wartime interests. There is the army camps that recruit tens of thousands of workers within them, become a hub of, uh, of labor mobilization. But there is also a lot more economic development and, uh, in Palestine because of the closures due to the war. So, so in, a, in a kind of a ironic turn of colonial developments, the fact that Palestine could no longer import actually enabled what the British had been preventing, which is the development of local industry. So there is a growth in the labor movement significantly in the 1940s during the war. And with that also a very significant increase in labor mobilization that is tied partially to the structures within the Palestinian society that is, by the end of the revolt, the traditional national leadership is mostly exiled out of Palestine. And there's a space, a political space for new forces, and the labor movement becomes a very prominent part in the new political force in Palestine, and particularly the communists and their influence within the labor movement try to shift the way that nationalist politics is Uh, expressed in a way that kind of combines the two. To give an idea of the economic upswing the war brought about, British and Allied military expenditure in Palestine for things like food, clothing, ammunition, construction, repair and maintenance, etc., totaled about 1 million Palestine pounds in 1940. By 1943, it was 12 million. Industrial exports went from less than half a million in 1940 to 11 million in 1945. This economic upswing resulted in tens of thousands of Arabs and Jews getting jobs not just in new or newly active factories and workshops, but also the various military bases that sprang up around Palestine. By 1943, around 35,000 Arabs and 15,000 Jews were employed directly by the British military at over 100 bases, while thousands more were employed in the various construction projects needed to service those bases. This expansion of the working class in Palestine meant that labour activists, particularly among Palestinians, began to mobilise again both within the Palestinian Arab Workers Society, or PAUSE, who we discussed in the previous episode, and other, sometimes new, organisations. So the 1940s, as an attempt at a different Palestinian politics, 
and within that, the labor movement becomes very, very significant. PAWS, which continue to exist formally, um, is revived, but it also is uh, joined by other movements. The communists in the early 1940s are have a lot of tension within them because one section of the Communist Party believes that what they should do is radicalize the Palestinian labor movement through PAWS. So what they want to do is become involved in pause itself and radicalize it from within. And in fact, they try very hard. Uh, pause at the time is very undemocratic. From its creation, other than the 1930 conference, there was never elections. It was very much controlled by one man for most of its years, and, and he uh, was conservative. Uh, in fact, at some point, he tries to kind of play into the British desire of having a non-politicized uh, union, um, which the Palestinian communists try to undermine and push for radicalization. One faction of the Palestinian communist movement in 1942 uh, decides to give up, led by Bolus Farah. They create a new union, the Federation of Arab Trade Unions and Labor Societies. The vast majority of the communists actually remain in pause and try to radicalize it from within. In those years, in the 40s, there is a massive increase in the number of trade unions all over Palestine in all kinds of industries. Um, so the, some of the industries have, have had um, traditional labor unions, um, the railway, the uh, oil refineries, uh, but now all kinds of other industries join into it, smaller industries, but also local unions. Dozens of branches are opened in all over Palestinian towns. Within that, um, Nazareth Union is created in October 1942, initially as part of PAS, but led by Palestinian communists. So it's actually communist affiliated. And they're able to do a lot of mobilizing on multiple levels. So they, they mobilize workers in the camps, but they also mobilize workers in small factories in Nazareth or Haifa. And, and, and they, they also mobilize within both British and Jewish-owned, but also Palestinian-owned industries. Bulus Farah, who Lena just mentioned, was a Palestinian communist who had worked at the Haifa Railway Workshop since he was 15. He joined the Communist Party in the 1930s, and in 1934 went to Moscow's University of Toilers of the East, where communists from across the colonised world gained political training. The Federation of Arab Trade Unions and Labour Societies, sometimes abbreviated as FALT or FATLS, that Farah's group was instrumental in setting up, quickly established itself as a force within the Palestinian labour movement. Workers joined FATLS at a number of large workplaces in and around Haifa, such as Shell and the Iraq Petroleum Company as well as at the poor and on the military camps. Both poor's and fatals would grow significantly in the coming years. It's hard to get an accurate picture due to unions inflating their numbers, overlaps in membership, etc., but an estimate of about 20,000 Palestinian workers organised into trade unions by the mid-40s seems about accurate. As the 40s progressed, a working-class cultural and political sphere began to develop in Palestine as well as annual events celebrating May Day, International Workers' Day on May 1st, local Palestinian unions also began organising workers' theatres, sports committees and social events. A number of producer and consumer cooperatives, as well as a credit union, were set up by local union branches. Fatals also began to publish a weekly newspaper, Al-Itihad, or Unity in English, to which left-leaning Paul's branches would contribute articles. As we'll go into later, it's important to note that many new Paul's branches were led by other Palestinian communists, not part of Bulus Farah's faction. Palestinian workers were also becoming increasingly assertive. So on the 30th of April 1944, the Histadrut's Palestinian section, the Palestine Labour League, who we discussed in part one, organised an event to celebrate May Day and open a new club in Jaffa. In response, members of the local Paul's branch packed out the meeting clapped, shouted and constantly directed questions at the speakers until the meeting eventually had to be abandoned. Afterwards, a leaflet was produced titled From Arab Workers to the Jewish Workers. Addressing their, quote, brother workers, end quote, the leaflet criticised the Histadrut's Hebrew labour policy discussed in part one. The leaflet read, quote, Imagine to yourselves what you would say if these same people who yesterday expelled you from your job came to you today talking about May Day, even while declaring that tomorrow too they will put you out of work, end quote. 
Written in Hebrew, it showed an obvious belief and desire among Palestinian leftists to find allies among the Jewish working class. The Palestinian labour movement was on the rise, but so too were frictions within it, especially between the new, more radical pause branches and their decidedly less radical leadership. The tension within the Palestinian labour movement grows, especially because the communists seek to politicize it, whereas Sami Taha and Paz is trying to maintain more labor-focused neutral, if not fully, but at least it's criticized by the communists to be such. Sami Taha, like so many Palestinian trade unionists, had come up working at the Haifa Railways and later as an office clerk. In the 1940s, still in his 20s, he became the leading figure within pause that was frequently criticised for his undemocratic and conservative leadership style. And eventually in 1945, the communists create a new union, the Arab Workers Congress, AWEC. And this union is has a very clear political line. It is very avidly anti-colonialist. It is very engaged in the national and political life of the Palestinians. So, for instance, actually, both PAWS and the AWC are involved in the struggle for holding municipal elections and particularly for holding democratic municipal elections because the British mandate laws only allowed voting for a group that paid particular level of taxes, of municipal taxes, which meant that in the case of Nazareth, for instance, in the 1946 elections, only 9% of the residents residents of Nazareth could vote. So it was male over a certain age and pay, tax paying. So 9% of the population. So the union becomes very involved in the struggle to hold elections, to expand the right to vote. And it's very clear in the communist case, it's a very clear anti-colonial struggle in which they, in one of the leaflets in, in Nazareth that they publish, they say, you know, the British are forbidding us from any other political participation, so we will use the municipal councils to um, mobilize for our democratic rights and do anti-colonial mobilization. So for them, there is a, a clear agenda that ties the national interest with a worker's interest. And they publish a newspaper called al Tehad, the unity, in which they're able to express their political opinions and kind of increase politicization. And I know from some of the interviews I had that some of the people who later join communist mobilization actually join it through reading it that they had in the buses on their way from Nazareth to Haifa because Nazareth was uh, very much a hinterland town. It was it had some industry. It had a lot of uh, British mandate workers. People worked in the civil administration or for the British mandate. It served as a commercial town for the villages around it, but it didn't have any real industry. It has very few factories. A lot of it was more workshops, but a very significant number of Nazareth workers traveled every day from Nazareth to Haifa to work in the railways and the refineries. Um, and it is that working class that is consolidated and led by, by the union and uh, kind of becomes very focal and, uh, and vocal in, in, in local Palestinian politics. The establishment of the Arab Workers' Congress in 1945 then saw Fatals merge with left-leaning pause branches, proving that the more radical wing of the labour movement was strong enough to strike out on its own rather than being tied to the more moderate pause. The AWC was an almost instant success. In October 1945, it took part in the World Trade Union Conference in Paris, where along with other Arab delegates, it successfully blocked both the passing of a pro-Zionist resolution and the election of the Histadrut delegate as the representative for the Middle East. Soon after the Paris Conference, the AWC held its second National Congress to approve its constitution where, alongside its goal of organising Arab workers in Palestine, it also stated its intention of, quote, working for the cooperation and solidarity of all Palestinian workers, irrespective of nationality, colour, religion or political belief, end quote, and to cooperate with all organisations working, quote, for Palestine's freedom and independence, for the establishment of a democratic government where all its citizens would enjoy equal rights, end quote. This second Congress was also notable for the higher number of women delegates, two of whom were elected to the Union's Central Committee. Palestinian communists had been at the forefront of setting up the Arab Workers' Congress. However, by this point, they were not acting as part of the Palestine Communist Party, 
as that had now completely broken up into a number of groups, the main division between them being along national lines. There is very significant tension between the Jewish and the Arab communists. During the revolt, there is several fractions within the Communist Party itself, within the PCP, and some of the Jewish members are very unhappy about the support for the rebellion, and, and especially there was a lot of violence in the rebellion and uh, in the revolt, and some of it targeted Jewish settlements, not only the British. But the common turn is able to keep that party as a unified party until 1943, when the Comintern itself is dissolved as a part of the uh, Soviet wartime policy or concession to its war partners. And once the Comintern is dissolved, there's nothing holding the two groups together. And the, the, the Palestine Communist Party, in fact, breaks into two parts. The Jewish group remain as PCP, and the Palestinian communists create a new uh, organization called the National Liberation League, the NLL, which is actually not a self-defined communist party, but a nationalist party, as the name suggests, with a clear socialist orientation. And the National Liberation League becomes very embroiled in both Palestinian nationalism and uh, Palestinian labor unions. They're never very big. They're always a, a, a small group, but it is a very dedicated group. It is a group of people who are able to mobilize far beyond their size. And they're able to offer some really interesting political insights. So the, the 1940s, especially with, a, with the ability of the Palestinian communists to act more independently and, and more directly engage the Palestinians, they become a really vocal, strong voice among the Palestinian community. And I, I, I mean, I mentioned that there is a particular historic moment in which there is the void created by the absence of the nationalist leadership during the revolt, but also a rise of, of labor mobilization and a rise of left politics that the communists, the Palestinian communists spearhead in, in the framework of the National Liberation League, but they also help create the League of Arab intellectuals, um, they are very instrumental in creating the Arab Workers Congress. And within these frameworks, they try to shift the discourse into a clearly anti-colonialist discourse that is very much mass-based. Uh, they try to promote mass-based politics. They try to promote politicization of the Palestinian national movement. So in the mid-40s, they have a huge campaign of uh, trying to say that the Palestinian, the reconstruction of the Palestinian national movement has to be democratic and has to include all factions of the Palestinian society, including the labor movement and the working classes and the, the, the poorer groups, not only the elite. They try to kind of become involved in a Palestinian struggle, but also challenge the Palestinian national leadership. And, and they were marginalized all along. And even when the Arab Higher Committee is reestablished in 46, they actually incorporate pause, but they exclude them from the, the, the newly reestablished Palestinian national leadership. And they still continue to be very persistent in their attempt to engage it, but also in their attempt to kind of politicize and, and and push for what they their vision also um have a very unique political vision of one state that is democratic in which all the people who live in it have equal rights so they reject the absolutely exclusionary worldview of both the zionist movement and the palestinian nationalist movement that refuse to allow for a compromise and they try to actually say and, and they come from a socialist understanding, right? If, if you center your world in an idea of a working class solidarity that will actually rule and become the one that makes the world a better place for everyone, then the nationalist division is not necessarily a breaking point. So for them, the Zionism is the enemy, not Jews. They're, they make, they're very clear about this, this, this distinction. They, they're attacked about it, but they're also very consistent about that. They don't, until post-48, they don't recognize national rights for Jews in Palestine. But they recognize the rights of those Jews living in Palestine to be equal citizens. So they have a vision that, for me, is one that can help us imagine a future, not only a past.
when that can incorporate a place in which the understanding of rights of solidarities is very different than what has been shaped since 1948. And of course, they themselves, the Palestinian communists, are forced to accept partition in the middle of the war in 1948. They are forced to then toe the line of their Jewish colleagues who were in a position of power in the 1950s and 60s um, and kind of accept the fait accompli of, of the Nakba and kind of try to create a, a space, at least for the Palestinians who become citizens of Israel, to be able to survive in their own country and stay on their land. But, um, but in the 40s, and, and up until November 1947, even after the, the Soviet Union betrays the idea of one state and, and supports partition and supports basically the Zionist claim to outside, um, they're able to maintain a, a, a vision that is very different from the reality that we can imagine now. The Nakba refers to the ethnic cleansing of Palestine and comes from the Arabic word meaning catastrophe. We discuss the Nakba in more detail later in this episode. As Lena pointed out, the National Liberation League consistently distinguished between Jews and Zionism. For instance, a January 1945 article in Al Ittihad stated clearly that, quote, we distinguish between the Zionist movement as an exploitative movement and the Jews, and Jewish workers specifically, as a minority in Palestine. In calling for an independent national regime, the Arab workers seek to liberate the broad masses of the people, Arab and Jewish, from the noose of exploitation and Zionism, and they declare that an independent national regime will ensure all just national rights to the Jews and the other minorities settled in Palestine. End quote. These were not just empty words. While it is important not to overstate how frequent such events were, Towards the end of the Second World War, instances of cooperation between Jewish and Palestinian workers were growing. On the 2nd of February 1944, for instance, following the injury of an Arab worker at the Haifa Railway workshops, a wildcat strike broke out involving all 1,400 workers, approximately 200 of whom were Jewish. A strike committee was formed consisting of three Arabs and two Jews who presented management with a list of demands, including not just the hiring of a permanent physician at the workshops, but also demands for pay rises, cost of living adjustments and compensation for workplace accidents. The workers then occupied the workshops, with Palestinians and Jews spending the night talking and singing around campfires. The local pools branch sent food, which Arab workers shared with their Jewish colleagues. Food also eventually arrived from the Histadrut, which Jewish workers also shared, but this was delayed as the Histadrut leadership were vehemently opposed to the strike and put pressure on its members to end it as soon as possible. Later that year, Palestinian and Jewish postal workers also embarked on a number of local joint strikes and, in the summer of 1945, organised a national conference which elected an executive committee made up of three Arabs and three Jews. Met with suspicion by both the Histadru and Paws, it was welcomed in Al Itihad, which wrote that, quote, the cooperation between Arab and Jewish telegraph and postal workers is clear proof of the possibility of joint action in every workplace, end quote. Small scale cooperation like this occurred with increasing frequency, though again it must be stressed beginning from a very low bar. However, it was the general strike in April 1946 that really stands out as an example of solidarity and cooperation between Arab and Jewish workers. So the 1946 strike is a very interesting event because it's an anomaly in many ways. 1946, it's important to stress, is this point where things in Palestine are deteriorating really bad. The national struggle is on the verge of exploding, things are, are bad, the boycott is is declared by the um, League of Arab States in 1946 against Zionist enterprises, Zionist movement is increasingly targeting the British colonial administration. So things are very hard in Palestine on the ground and there is the national tension is, is, is palatable and clear. And then at the same time, there is also, um, because of the end of the war, the work camps are now closing and thousands of workers are being fired. Um, there are struggles of those workers. Um, so there is things that are very hard, but this particular strike starts with postal workers in Tel Aviv, um, Arab and Jewish workers. And it starts, um, it's agreed upon between the, the Hisadrut and Paz and it, as, a, as a limited strike 
And because of all the, the factors that are going on and because uh, in the post-war economy, the, the wages are severely impacted and, um, and all these things, within a very short time, it actually grows exponentially. Uh, so within days, civil servants, mid and, mid and lower level, white and blue collar employees join the, stri- the strike. They're able to basically paralyze the mandate uh, administration, and they compel the government to grant um, serious con- concessions to the strike. So, the, so in that sense, the strike is a success, and leftist forces, both Arab and Jewish, um, uh, actually uh, consider this a victory to Arab and Jewish workers, and evidence that uh, working class solidarity could uh, succeed. Uh, but at the same time, it's also worth mentioning that both conservative sides, the Hissed Root and Paws, worked very hard to prevent the expansion of the strike to the refineries, um, something that would have made the strike um, much more effective and, and, and large scale, but something that was not in the interest of um, both the Arab leaders, and, and there is some evidence that uh, uh, Sami Taha Paws got requests from the Arab countries to to prevent the spread of the of the strike, um, and Hissa Drut was worried about the implications for the for the national conflict. So on the one hand, the strike is this glimpse of the possibility of of co struggling and, and and joint work. And the communists, the Palestinian communists, slot it as a significant moment, a moment that shows the the possibility um, and the possibility of of working together, but it also is one that kind of proves the limitations of what was possible at that moment. While the attempts of both the Histadru and Paul's to stop the strike from spreading were successful with regard to oil and camp workers, the strike still spread rapidly to other workers to include not just the postal service and civil servants, but also rail, public works and port workers, with around 23,000 involved in the strike at one point. By the end of the month, the strike had won significant improvements on pay, cost of living adjustments and pensions. Arab and Jewish communists declared the strike a, quote, blow against the divide and rule policy of imperialism, a slap in the face of those who hold chauvinist ideologies and propagate national division, end quote. In a similar vein, the Arab Workers' Congress described the strike as, quote, historic, the first time in Palestine that Arab and Jewish workers have united to show that there are no differences between them and that they have a common enemy, end quote. The 1946 general strike was not the last instance of joint action. As late as May 1947, between 40 and 50,000 Jewish and Arab military camp workers participated in a one-day strike against redundancies. However, though this period saw an unprecedented rise in joint action between Jewish and Palestinian workers, ultimately it was still too embryonic a movement to alter the course of events in Palestine. Despite the rapid proletarianisation that had taken place since the start of the war, the Palestinian working class was still very small. For instance, in 1944, in an Arab population of over 1.2 million, the Palestinian labour force outside of agriculture still only numbered around 100,000 workers. The Arab working class was also extremely dispersed, so while we've discussed large employers like the railways and oil refineries, it's important to point out that, by 1947, almost 58% of Palestinian industry was made up of small enterprises employing fewer than 10 workers. While much of the Palestinian national leadership had been destroyed in the repression of the 1936 revolt, the Palestinian working class was not yet large and strong enough to take its place. All of this is before having to contend with the fact that the vast majority of those Jewish workers that Palestinians had been taking joint action with were, by virtue of the fact that they were in Palestine, committed to varying degrees to the establishment of some form of Jewish state. And their principal labour organisation, the Histadrut, was absolutely ideologically committed to one based on the exclusion of Palestinians and had been working towards that objective for almost three decades. Zionist paramilitary attacks increased in both frequency and intensity in this period following World War II. Senior British military personnel were assassinated and numerous bombings took place, including one at the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, the headquarters of the British colonial administration, which killed 91 people. The pull towards war and the expulsion of the Palestinian people was gaining pace. 
By 1947, the British are exhausted from the war and they're also exhausted from dealing with their resistance in Palestine, particularly the Zionist targeting that they decide to give up the Palestine mandate. So they turn to the UN, which had replaced the League of Nations, and ask it to resolve the issue. The UN appoints a committee, a UNESCO, that uh, basically investigates and, and decides that Palestine should be partitioned into three parts, an Arab state that is 42% of historic Palestine, a Jewish state, and 56% of the rest international. It's worth pointing out that at this time, even despite decades of Jewish immigration, 70% of the population were still Palestinian Arabs. I will highlight that the decision comes very short after the Holocaust, with a lot of sympathy to the victims of the Holocaust, and with very little consideration to the Palestinians who were being victimized. The Zionist movement accepts the partition plan, even though research has shown now that it was only a strategic acceptance and that the Zionist movement never intended to actually accept the borders of the partition plan. And war broke out pretty much immediately after the partition plan, uh, November 29. It started in fighting in the cities and spread Uh, The war is typically divided into two parts, uh, what is called civil war, which is from November until May uh, 14th, until the declaration of the State of Israel. It was a war between the Haganah and the Yishuv forces and Palestinian irregulars with some volunteers from the Arab countries. And then after the declaration of the State of Israel in May 48, the Arab states declared war. And between then and 49, that was uh, what we could be called the formal war, uh, war was unequal. The, as I mentioned, the British had allowed the uh, Yishuv to create state institutions, including an army. The Palestinians were not equipped, did not have the manpower or the arms that the Yishuv had. Um, so even though Israel originally and continues to claim that it was a David versus Goliath war, that Israel was the David that had to face all the Arab countries, research has shown that Israel had more military power, more soldiers, more trained forces, more arms, and the Arabs were untrained, unarmed, and uh, also divided. The Haganah that Lena mentions was the main Zionist paramilitary force during the Mandate Rule of Palestine. Other paramilitary forces in the Yishuv included the Ergun, a more extreme group who split from the Haganah in 1935, and who Albert Einstein compared to the Nazis, describing them as right-wing chauvinist terrorists, and Lehi, sometimes known as the Stern Gang, a 1940 split from the Ergun that had actually sought out cooperation with the Nazis. By the time of the 1948 war, Zionist paramilitaries could rely on a force of 50,000 troops which had amassed a small air force and navy as well as tank, armoured car and heavy artillery units. Zionist forces also enjoyed extensive training from the British who helped form the Palmach, an elite fighting force set up in 1941 in case the Nazis invaded Palestine. Haganah forces also gained experience during the repression of the 1936 revolt when their troops were attached to British detachments to carry out punitive actions against Palestinian villages. The Haganah also had an intelligence unit, which for years had been mapping out Palestinian villages, studying the best ways to attack them and keeping tabs on leaders and militants, such as those who had taken part in the revolt. In contrast, during this first phase, Palestinians only had around 7,000 irregular fighters, soon joined by a few thousand volunteers from neighbouring Arab countries. Of course, in the next phase of the war, after the State of Israel was declared in May 1948, tens of thousands of troops from Arab armies would enter the war, but they were still significantly outnumbered by Zionist forces. It also meant that, for almost six months following the UN's partition resolution, Palestinians were facing a well-armed and trained army with a makeshift force of only a few thousand. The Arab countries, once they enter the war, fight for their own interests, which is very divided and not saving the Palestinians. For instance, the Jordanian agreement with the British and the Zionist movement to basically take over the Arab part of Palestine and prevent the creation of a Palestinian country. But in this process, the Zionist movement, the Yishuv, and then later Israel, conducted a large-scale expulsion of the Palestinians. There's an argument of whether this 
counts as ethnic cleansing or not. And particularly the question that is most contested is whether there was uh, an overall Israeli or Zionist and later Israeli plan to expel the Palestinians. I view this as less relevant because, A, there is a very significant, thorough documentation of expulsion, large-scale expulsion of Palestinians by the uh, Ergun and the other Jewish forces, and then later by the Israeli army, by one of the most staunch advocates that it was not ethnic cleansing, Benny Morris. Benny Morris has one of the most elaborate research about the events that led to the creation of the Palestinian refugee problem, and he details the massacres and the expulsions and the terrorizing that took place over the war. Uh, He concludes that it was uh, a result of war, not intention. But if you look at the scale, along with the history of transfer ideology that the Zionist organization had, along with the fact that uh, 45% of the people of the planned Jewish state would have been uh, Palestinian Arabs, And most importantly, the fact that Israel prevented the return of the refugees and it was a strategic decision from early on, immediately during the war, to prevent the return of any of the refugees, then there is no question how the Palestinian refugee issue was created. Uh, It was created by direct acts of expulsion, but it was also created by massacres. Benny Morris is probably one of the foremost Zionist historians today. As Lena mentioned, he has produced extensive research, though always from a deeply ideologically Zionist perspective, on the atrocities that took place as part of the Zionist state-building project. His book, The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem Revisited, explains as a matter of fact that the expulsion of the Palestinians was, quote, inevitable and inbuilt into Zionism, because it sought to transform a land which was Arab into a Jewish state, and the Jewish state could not have arisen without a major displacement of the Arab population. And because this aim automatically produced resistance among the Arabs, which, in turn, persuaded the Yishuv's leaders that a hostile Arab majority or large minority could not remain in place if a Jewish state was to arise or safely endure. End quote. Of course, Morris also sprinkles in a hefty dose of disingenuousness to his frankness about Zionist ethnic cleansing. So, while he acknowledges that the displacement of the Palestinians was inbuilt into Zionism, that leading Zionists such as Israel's first Prime Minister had made both public and private statements and written letters and diary entries underlining the need to reduce the Arab population in Palestine, that massacres and mass expulsions took place, that Plan Dalet existed, a military plan that included the destruction of villages with the stipulation that, quote, the villages which you will capture, cleanse or destroy will be decided according to consultation with your advisers on Arab affairs and the intelligence officers, end quote. And that these were essential to the founding of the State of Israel, all of this does not amount to a premeditated program for ethnic cleansing. Rather, the ethnic cleansing was supposedly an unplanned and unfortunate outcome of the war. It's also worth noting that, in 2004, Morris stated that this ethnic cleansing was justified, unironically comparing it to the ethnic cleansing of Native Americans, saying, quote, Even the great American democracy could not have been created without the annihilation of the Indians. There are cases in which the overall final good justifies harsh and cruel acts that are committed in the course of history, end quote. Here, Lena describes some of those harsh and cruel acts. There was large-scale massacres against the Palestinians. Darya Sin is very well known, but Darya Sin is only one of money. In Darya Sin, 109 Palestinians were killed by the right-wing militias. But Darya Sin was used by the Haganah to terrorize the Palestinians. They spread the rumors. In fact, for a long time, it was claimed that 250 people were killed because that number was exaggerated and spread to cause people terror to make them run and leave. But there is the massacre in Lid in the Dahmash Mosque in which 250 Palestinians were killed. There were massacres in Tantura. There were massacres in small scale massacres in villages where the Israeli army would come and line a few young men and shoot them. 
uh, in the center of the village in order to make people run away. There's such massacres in El Abun, in El Krum. There are massacres, dozens of massacres. But those were not the only ones, uh, as I mentioned. There were also like actual expulsions where they put people on trucks and force them to walk or um, or, or force them to, to leave. But there are also the, mass- the expulsion of Lid, or what is called Lidda in English, in which they forced 10,000 people to march in mid-July in the heat from uh, Lidda to Ramallah under the threat of power. And many people died in what I could describe as the trail of tears for those who know American history. But the outcome of these actions is that by the end of the war, by the armistice agreements in 1949, 750,000 Palestinians had become refugees. Israel had controlled 78% of historic Palestine, and the rest of historic Palestine was divided between Jordan controlled the West Bank and Egypt controlled the Gaza Strip. And some 150,000 Palestinians became citizens of Israel. The Trail of Tears that Lena mentioned refers to the forced displacement of around 60,000 Native Americans in the mid-19th century, many thousands of whom died. The events of the Nakba were the brutal culmination of decades of political, economic and military preparation on the part of the Zionist movement and any examination of them should put paid to the idea that Zionism is anything but a settler colonial project. But the attempt to confuse this quite simple reality has unsurprisingly become an important plank of pro-Israeli propaganda. In an article in the New Statesman last November, British author Howard Jacobson claims that, quote, Zionism wasn't a colonial enterprise. The founding of Israel wasn't an act of colonial depredation. Fleeing from pogroms isn't colonising. A refugee isn't a colonist. End quote. Jacobson is obviously hiding the ball here, ignoring the issues complicating his argument that we've touched on in these episodes, such as the formation of Zionist paramilitary groups that carried out massacres against Palestinian civilians. But he also ignores the fact that Zionists themselves often figured their project in explicitly colonial terms. For instance, in 1902, one of the founders of modern Zionism, Theodore Herzl, wrote to Cecil Rhodes, who had just colonised an area of southern Africa which would become known as Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe and Zambia, describing Zionism as, quote, a colonial idea, end quote. In a similar vein, Vladimir Yabotinsky, whose revisionist Zionism was extremely influential on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his Likud party, wrote in 1923 that, quote, Zionist colonisation even the most restricted, must be carried out in defiance of the will of the native population, end quote. The native population, of course, being the Palestinians. These quotes show the absurdity of attempts by Zionists to use words like indigenous or national liberation to dress their project up in progressive language when historic Zionists were so explicit about it being a colonial project. In the end, the State of Israel was founded on 14th of May 1948, but the atrocities would continue for another year, and indeed periodically until the present day, in a process that is sometimes referred to as the ongoing Nakba. It's no surprise then that Israeli leaders have invoked the Nakba in relation to the latest genocidal campaign in Gaza. The newly formed State of Israel was quickly recognised by Western powers, and within a few days it was recognised by the Soviet Union. This followed the USSR's support for the UN's partition plan the previous year, which, much to the dismay of Arab communists, broke with the Soviet Union's historic support for a united Palestine lived in by both Jews and Arabs. Furthermore, in late March 1948, just weeks after the approval of Plan Dalet, the Haganah even started receiving weapons from Czechoslovakia as part of a deal brokered by the Soviet Union. This deal was made with help from the now entirely Jewish Communist Party which in 1947 briefly changed its name to the Communist Party of the Land of Israel, thus taking on the ancient Jewish and modern Zionist name for the region that communists had always rejected. Mayor Vilna, a communist activist since the 1930s, even signed the Israeli Declaration of Independence on the party's behalf. And, after the founding of the Israeli state, veteran Palestinian communists who had managed to remain in Israel and wanted to join the Communist Party first had to engage in public self-criticism regarding their supposed mistakes related to their recognition of the Jewish nation. 
Ultimately, the Palestinian workers' movement during the British mandate was faced with an insurmountable task. In a context of British colonial rule and faced with the hostile institutions of a hostile settler community, Palestinian workers created organisations to defend themselves on the job and, by the 1940s, they had developed a distinctly democratic working-class pole within the anti-colonial movement. And, while fleeting and embryonic, the labour movement was also a place where Arab and Jewish workers were able to come together on the basis of class solidarity, pointing towards an alternative future to one based on capitalism and settler colonialism. More often than not, it was the Palestinian communists who were most able to articulate that alternative future. For me, centering Palestinian communist and Palestinian labor movement does that in a way that is very different. And, and it is, I don't know, there is something that is very hard not to be cynical about thinking about Zionists who are envisioning a shared world, whereas anti-Zionists trying to envision this world. Palestinians who in, you know, in the aftermath of the revolt, I mean, the, the, the Yishuv was part of the crushing of the Palestinian society. And the Palestinian society was really crushed in the aftermath of the revolt. But to be able to kind of say, no, let us be clear about the terminology. We are opposed to Zionism. Zionism is our enemy. But Jews are not. And we can have, can have solidarity with the Jewish workers. And we can, we can build a working class solidarity that takes us out of this impasse. That is anti-colonial and anti-Zionist and one that aspires for a true democratic society. That's it for our double episode on the class struggle in mandate ruled Palestine. Patrons can join us for our bonus episode in which we talk to Lena about the curious relationship of British authorities to the Palestinian workers' movement, as well as the experience of the labour movement in Nazareth and the dishonesty of Zionists in relation to the slogans of the Free Palestine movement. Available now exclusively for our supporters on Patreon. It's only support from you, our listeners, which allows us to make these podcasts. So if you appreciate our work, please do think about joining us at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, link in the show notes. In return for your support, you get early access to content as well as ad-free episodes, exclusive bonus content, discounted merch and more. And if you can't spare the cash, absolutely no problem, please just tell your friends about this podcast and give us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. If you'd like to learn more about workers' struggles in mandate-ruled Palestine, Check out the webpage for this episode where you'll find images, a full list of sources, further reading and more. We've also got a great selection of books available about Palestinian and Israeli history in our online store. And you can get 10% off them and anything else using the discount code WCHPODCAST. Link in the show notes. Thanks also to our Patreon supporters for making this podcast possible. Special thanks to Jameson D. Saltzman, Jazz Hands, Fernando Lopez Ojeda and Jeremy Cusimano. Our theme tune is Bella Ciao. Thanks for permission to use it from Dischi del Sole. You can buy it or stream it on the links in the show notes. This episode was edited by Tyler Hill. Anyway, that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed the episodes and thanks for listening. Que se muoio da partigiano, oh bella ciao.